Uh, the next page, uh, Lord, I want to be a Christian, 319. 319. Thank you. 
God, as we kneel before you this morning, we invite your presence here with us. Send the Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts to receive the blessings that you have for us today. Bless each person here. May all that we do and say be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it a wonderful, beautiful Sabbath day today? It is, amen. And we can praise God because we are alive to see it. As you know, many people did not awaken when they went to sleep last night, but God in his infinite grace and love for you and for me caused us to open our eyes, to take in that deep breath, and hopefully with our first breath we said, thank you, Lord, amen. Welcome to the Chula Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church. On behalf of Pastor Williams and myself, we would like to say that we're grateful that you have chosen to worship with us today. And if we have any guests in our midst, we want you to also know that you are more than welcome. And today, you are no longer a guest. You are family, and we want to encourage you to participate in all the activities that this church family has. So welcome again and we pray that you will have a blessed day today. On behalf of our announcements, Sister Rodica would like me to inform the choir members and anyone else that is interested in choir that today there will be a rehearsal at 4 p.m. So that's 4 p.m. today for choir rehearsal. And I'd like to ask Keith to please come out. He has a wonderful, exciting Pathfinder announcement. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, there's an orange flyer in there. It has to do with the Pathfinder car wash. We're going to have it a week from Sunday. It will be a minimum $5. You may find some of the Pathfinders trying to sell you a ticket. Or you can come without tickets and just pay when you get there. So that will be next weekend, next Sunday, September 30th. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Keith. I told them that I'm keeping my car especially dirty so that the Pathfinders can scrub it clean. And it's a $5 donation, but I trust that you'll give more than $5. Amen. The Pathfinders really need to have this fundraiser. We'd also like to remind you also on the orange sheet that today is Picnic at the Bell. Yay. Anybody want to say yay with me? Yay. <laughs> I'm excited. And I'm hungry. So... We will see you at the bell when church is over. And no further announcements. I would like to have us turn for our scripture to Psalm 62 and invite Brother Bamford up to read our scripture for us today. Morning, church family. Morning. 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 Are we on? Yes, we're on. Good, good, good. Okay, if we can turn to uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 62. We'll be looking at verses 1 and 2. Psalm 62, verses 1 and 2. The word says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Our hymn of praise is number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God only wise. Number 21.
all who is possible, please join me in kneeling for prayer. Sabbath day, where we can gather together and join together in prayer, in praise, and in communion with you. We thank you for being with us during the week, for all the things that you provide for us in our daily lives. There is so much negative and sad, disturbing news in the world, Lord. Let us go to you with all our concerns and victories, and may our faith grow in you. Please forgive us our sins as we seek your forgiveness. We lift those up who are not here today, whether sickness, travel, or other condition. We especially lift up Robert Smith, Lord, our brother, who's having some serious health issues, Lord. We ask that your arms are around him, Lord, and comfort him. We also lift up Pastor Bradley as he has lost his aunt, and uh, we pray for comfort for his family, Lord. We ask that uh, these prayers come up to you, Lord, and may they be answered according to your will. We continue to pray for our missionaries who are around the world, Lord, and as well as our armed forces, the ladies and men who are serving this country, Lord, and we pray that you're with them. Please bless Pastor Lynch and her ministry, Lord. And we ask that your Holy Spirit strengthen her today as she gives her sermon, Lord. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. It's now time for our lambs offering and children's story. So I'd like to invite all the lambs to come up. And if you have an offering for them, please hold it high and they'll come by and pick it up from you. All the lambs, please come forward. There they are. Here they come. And if you do have an offering, just hold it up high and they'll come by and pick it up from you.
still one in the back. Okay, and today Sally Rogers will be bringing our children's story. Come and sit down. Oh boy, I'm so happy today. Are you happy today? Amen. Oh my goodness, it doesn't matter what kind of weather is outside, no matter where you are at, Sabbath is a happy day. Amen. Are you happy? Oh, me too. I am happy every Sabbath, especially when we come to God's house. And you know what? Each time we come, we learn about who? That's right. And the more we learn, we become stronger and we grow, grow, grow. Until he comes, we'll be so strong. Prepare for the Lord. Today, we are going to learn about sanctuaries. Do you know about any sanctuaries mentioned in the Bible? Where's the first one? What do you think is the first sanctuary mentioned in the Bible? Where? Jesus' sanctuary, but is the first one is in heaven. That's right. And the second one, and the wilderness, it was built, right? The sanctuary that Moses built. And the third one we're going to talk about. We're going to skip all the other ones because we are going to continue. But we're going to speak of the last one. The last one in the last days. Who do you think is going to be the sanctuary? Where is it going to be? Where do you think? Oh, you don't know. But I'm going to show you. This is God's sanctuary. Open it up. Who's the sanctuary in there? Who's that? Who is it? Who is the sanctuary in the last days? No, who do you see there? I see somebody in there. Oh, that's right. Who's the sanctuary? Who's the sanctuary in the last days? That is right, boys and girls. We are a living sanctuary for the Lord. Yes, sirree. Each one of us. But you know, to make this beautiful sanctuary, it takes tools to build, right? Strong tools, and that's what we need. Because I am going to ask her to read to me. The, can you read it for me, loud and clear? She's going to read. Who is the sanctuary? See, the Bible tells us each time we learn what does the sanctuary says. Sixteen, as I not that you are the temple of God and the, the spirit of God. <laughs> you hear that? God's word said that you are the temple. You are God's living sanctuary for the Lord. Read it up. I'm going to give you a piece of paper so everyone of you will take it home and will read it. And if you don't know how to read, you can ask mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. Anybody knows how to read it, you tell them, read, it. read this to me. I want to know more about it. Okay, so you, I'll give you guys a piece of paper so you will know and take it home with you so you can practice. And then I want you guys to remember Galatians 5. Can you say that? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I want you guys to read it because all the tools to build your sanctuary is in there. And every one of us need to memorize that because every one of us need to show God's love to others, bring peace to others. Everyone that you need to have a tool there to build your sanctuary. Okay, we're going to prepare ourselves. Now let's show our path. I told you Pastor William, William's going to come back next week. I want you to surprise him. And you know the song, Lord prepare me. Okay, can you stand up? And we're going to face those people over there. They cannot speak or hear, but we're going to be able to sing to them in their language. Okay, everybody stand up. Get ready. Everybody that knows it, you can sing with us. Okay. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a And look at our brothers and sisters here. They'll be happy to see us singing their language. One, two, three. Lord, prepare me 
to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a Sabbath boys and girls, do your homework. What? Read 1 Corinthians 3.16, that you are a temple. Galatians 5, 22, 23. And those are the tools to build your living sanctuary. Happy Sabbath. It's now time for our offering. And the offering today goes for the Conference Church and School Building Fund. And uh, what that does is it helps to put money into a fund specifically for uh, refurbishing or remodeling uh, churches and schools and also building new churches and schools. Our thought for today is found from the book that we are studying every Wednesday night. I'd invite you to please come out to the prayer meeting. You'll enjoy it immensely. It's Patriarchs and Prophets. This is chapter 50 of Patriarchs and Prophets. And the very first page of that chapter, the title is Tithes and Offerings. In the Hebrew economy, one-tenth of the income of the people was set apart to support the public worship of God. Thus Moses declared to Israel, all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. This is found in Leviticus chapter 27. The system of tithes and offerings was intended to oppress upon the minds of men with a great truth. And this is true for us today as well that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. <coughs> Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. Bless us now as we return this money to you. May it be used in the way that you see fit. May it be multiplied and bless many others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. During our offering, Jim Rapp, our chairman from the nominating committee, is going to come up and discuss the nominating report with you. Good morning, church family. In your bulletins, this week you'll also find an insert which is the report from the nominating committee and this is the week we have the first reading Jesus said about the time that we live in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations and then shall the end come and his spirit invites each one of us to work for him according to our ability. A month or so ago, I spoke to you with a partial report for offices that needed to get started before uh, the new year. You'll see in this report, those are listed along with officers for the coming year, 2013. You'll see here, uh, the list of all the different areas and in most cases the leaders of those areas who have been asked and have accepted our nomination to serve in those offices. And your part as a church family is to go over that list. First of all, to make sure that we haven't missed something, to make sure that it's accurate, but also so that you're aware of all the different 
ministries and activities that are going on here so that you can be a part of them yourselves. On behalf of the nominating committee, I'd like to thank each one of the officers who's completed a term of service, as well as thank all of those nominated officers who have agreed to serve in the coming year. And I ask each one of you to look over th this list over carefully and see where your abilities lead you in his service. Thank you on behalf of the nominating committee. Today our worship and music will be brought to us by Ernie and Olga Sanchez. Thank you. to the Messiah and when Jesus was baptized he returned from the 40 uh, days in the wilderness John pointed to him and he could have said here's the Messiah look at the Messiah or he could have said here's the Savior he could have said many different things but he said behold the lamb of god behold the lamb of god and jesus later told us that it is as we lift him up that he draws all unto himself all we have to do is lift him up and this morning we're going to sing about beholding the Lamb of God, mighty in battle. Come worship Christ our 
the Lord, his victory is yours, his mighty battle. Shout to the Lord, his king Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Can we say amen again? Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Ernie and Olga. It's, I know envious is not a good word, but I'm kind of envious of people that can play instruments and who can sing. So I can talk, but one of these days when we get to the kingdom, we're all going to have those special gifts. Amen. And I'm looking forward to that. It's a privilege to be standing here before you as your spokesperson for this Sabbath day. As we know, Pastor Williams had a death in the family, and he's traveling, so we want to continue to pay, pray for Pastor Williams. And how many of you enjoyed last week all the messages that Pastor Trujillo presented for us? Amen. For me, they were amazing blessings, as I was reminded of God's waves of grace and Actually, Pastor Trujillo's messages really impacted my preparation for the message this today because God impressed me by his Holy Spirit just how much Jesus Christ has done for us. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit just orchestrates things because I didn't know that Sally was going to talk about the sanctuary. And then I didn't know that our special music was going to talk about how Jesus is our, our Lamb of God who is pleading for us in, this, in the heavenly sanctuaries. And my message has a lot to do with that today. So God is so awesome. But, you know, before I get to the message today, which you read in your bulletin, and it's entitled A Perfect Defense, last night on Fox uh, News on online, I saw a clip that talked about breaking news that they have found this papyrus. Uh, it was recently found. Of course, its authenticity is being challenged. It's being debated. It's questionable. And all the theologians are debating whether or not this papyrus that they found is legitimate. Because on the papyrus, it says that Jesus Christ had a wife or that Jesus Christ was married. Anybody hear that news? Ludicrous. Crazy, yes, Rebecca. <laughs> well, I, t I decided that I'm not going to get pulled into that deception, amen? Because, saints of God, as we get closer and closer to the coming of Christ, we are going to see, we're going to hear, and we're going to read about things that are so strange and things that completely negate that which we know of God's word. Because Satan, he basically, he comes to distract he comes to divide, and he comes to destroy. And he is bringing all of these last day tactics to turn our minds away. But I'm so glad that we have the word of God. Amen? Amen. We can stand on this. And one of my favorite scriptures that really tells us about that, we need to trust God's word, is found in Isaiah. Uh, and I'm going to read Isaiah 8.20. And it says, To the law and to the testimony, or to Moses and the prophets. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. So if whatever you hear, if it doesn't come from God's word, ignore it. Just like I'm ignoring that whole 
concept about Jesus having a wife. It's so crazy. So that was the commercial. Now let's get to the sermon. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we have already approached your throne, and I'm so grateful that your spirit is here. And I invite the holy angels to dwell with us also, and, and let your spirit just be the words in my mouth so that you will be glorified in all that is said and done, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've titled this message, A Perfect Defense. And you know, I'm getting a little reverb. Is this on or am I on here? What? OK. So should I stay away from this one? It's muted. It's, muted. it's true. <laughs> it's a perfect defense. And you know, I consulted dictionary.com to get definitions for the word defense. And on dictionary.com, they showed me eight different descriptions of the word defense. But basically, the main concept of the word defense, according to dictionary.com, is to protect and or to guard against. And out of those eight results, I'm going to use four and compact those four out of the eight to bring our sermon to you today. Now, here are the four definitions. I want you to pay attention to those. You may want to write them down so that you'll remember. Defense, a position on the field to defend against an opponent in sports. Anybody understand that illustration? Oh, you men should be raising your hand right about now. Some ladies, too. What are we talking about here? Football. To defend against an opponent in sports. Definition number two, defense. A method of protecting the physical or functional integrity of body or mind. Defense. Definition number three. An organization or army of defenders, military forces to safeguard a people, a nation, and a country. And my favorite, defense, the defending of a cause or the defending of a person by speech or argument as in an attorney to defend, to advocate on behalf of another. And you know, I find it amazing that in the English language, we have one word, defense, and it has all of these descriptives, but they all tell a little different side of what the word defense means. And when I finish today, I'm hoping that you will have a different appreciation for the word defense, and you will give God the deserved praise that he needs, amen? But let's review the four definitions one more time. Defense, to defend against an opponent in sports, to protect the physical or functional integrity of mind and body, an organization or army of defenders to safeguard a people, to safeguard our nation. We prayed for our troops today. And a defending cause of a person or speech as in an, an attorney. So here we go, defense as an opponent, an illustration in sports. I have to confess that I am not a football enthusiast. No throw, don't throw any stones. I am not a football enthusiast, but believe me, I've tried on many occasions to understand that game. And, and for single women, you may understand that this could be socially unacceptable or it could be you know, to your detriment if you don't understand football if you're single. So Althea, you know, all you other ladies out there, learn football. I've tried on many occasions to understand our nation's fascination to this game, but I just don't get it. I've even gone online, I'll confess, I've gone online and I've looked at football for dummies and football 101. Did you think I learned anything? Absolutely not. I still don't get it. And to be honest with you, I was a cheerleader in high school and I was a cheerleader in two years of college and we stood at the football games and we cheered when they had, had the, the, what is it called? The touchdown, see? <laughs> we cheered and we said, yay, touchdown, but that's all I knew. I didn't understand what they were doing out there on the field. So my football friends, I have, in, you know, got a hold of some of my friends, my male siblings, my brothers, 
friends and they just endured long hours sitting me in front of the game, the television, trying to help me understand. And I began to catch on just a little, little bit. And I found myself becoming fascinated with the defensive line. Remember, we're talking about a perfect defense. And during one of my many lessons from my football teachers, one of them made this statement that truly sunk into my brain. And he said, the best offense is a good defense. Amen. Keep that in mind as we proceed today. The best offense is a good defense. The football defensive line, I found out, utilizes great strategy and skill and strength to keep the opposite team from scoring. They are sort of like guardians defending against an opponent. Say that with me, guardians defending against an opponent. Say that with me, guardians defending against an opponent, amen. So I'm still talking about a perfect defense. Definition number two, defense. The method of protecting the physical or functional integrity of body or mind. Let me repeat that. The method of protecting the physical or functional integrity of body or mind. And let me also use this definition by way of another personal illustration. It might be difficult for you to believe, but as an adolescent, I was not very popular. I was known as what they call a goody two-shoes. Someone that are up there in my age know, have you ever heard that term, goody two-shoes? Yeah. Jim is shaking his head. I bet you you were one. <laughs> a goody, Frank, you were too. Okay, a goody two shoes. So that made me unpopular, and I was the brunt of a lot of cruel jokes and teasing. And I didn't have any older brothers or sisters who could, you know, protect me. So I was extremely vulnerable. And as a goody two shoes or sometimes you might call them today nerds or squares or lame or whatever. But as a goody two-shoes, you were prime pickings for the classic school bully. And I may have shared this with you during a children's story, uh, parts of this scenario before, I can't remember, but I've told it before. And so I was prime pickings for the classic school bully, Jean. The classic school bully, Jim. And her name was Beatrice. It was a girl, classic school bully. Her name was Beatrice. And Beatrice intimidated everyone. And it was not because of her size. She was a little bitty something. But in my mind, in my terrified adolescent mind, I believed truly that she was the daughter of Satan. And I never wanted to encounter Beatrice. And so Beatrice lived what we call across town or in the hood. And my family lived in the projects. Anybody heard of projects? We lived in the projects. We were one of the first families to move into this wonderfully well-developed, manicured, box cutter style development for low-income people. And it was called Mount Airy Projects. So the students that lived over in the hood or across town, they hated us kids that lived in the projects because we lived in a new house, even though it wasn't ours. And they assumed that we thought we were better than they because they lived in the, you know, in the ghetto, for lack of another sensitive term. And we lived in this nice, pristine housing development called Mount Airy. Strike one for me because Beatrice didn't like kids who lived in the projects. And also, their walk to school was about a couple miles, whereas my walk to school from the projects was only about four or five blocks. They built it really close to the elementary school. And so again, I would purposely take the longer route to school because I wanted to avoid running into Beatrice. Because invariably, our, our paths would cross you know, as we got closer to school. But however, as fate would have it, Lord, 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 as fate would have it, on one day, on my way to school, my carefully planned route didn't work. 
And there she stood, about a block away, I could see her. Beatrice and her gang of thug wannabes. Fear gripped my heart. My pace came to a screeching halt. My brain went into overdrive and my eyes darted left and right to see where was I going to run. And I thought, where's a police officer when you need one? And I thought to myself, oh, you're doomed, you're doomed. And as I said that in my mind, I could hear Beatrice saying, I'm going to get you today, Milligan. That's my maiden name. Milligan, you are mine, she, she continued yelling. What could I do? What could this adolescent child do all alone? So I stood there paralyzed in terror, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And those elementary delinquents just kept getting closer and closer. And I kept praying and praying and standing on my little knees just a knocking. And as my childlike prayers ascended into the heavens, then to my amazement, Christian friends, Beatrice and her thugs stopped dead in their tracks. They stopped, and I'm standing right here. And I could see that the satanic look in her eyes had changed. And her balled up fist, which she had been throwing in the air up to me, suddenly released. And it seemed as if her evil intended gaze was now no longer focused on my angelic face. <laughs> but she was looking at something behind me. She seemed to be looking over my shoulder at something instead of right at me. And again, to my amazement, Beatrice the bully and her cronies, they turned and they walked away. And when, within seconds of her humble retreat from me, there came around my shoulder this large, huge, pale arm, and it rested on my shoulder. And I turned around to look, and who did I see? I saw Big Patsy. Now, Big Patsy, was also an elementary school friend. And we called her that. She was a Caucasian girl. We called her Big Patsy because she was as large and round as she was tall. And she dwarfed most of, us, most of us neighborhood kids. Big Patsy was also not very attractive. She was less popular than I was. And Big Patsy didn't dress very well all the time. Sometimes her clothes didn't match. Sometimes they were tattered and torn. Sometimes she didn't smell very well. And Big Patsy kept to herself pretty much at school. But I would always say hello to Big Patsy when I saw her. I would never tease her like the other children did. And I would be kind to Big Patsy. I would say hello because she lived right across the street. Well, apparently that hello was enough to earn me an invitation to one of her birthday parties. And she, I was invited to her party. And all the neighborhood kids joined. And her mother served, I'll never forget this, it's like etched in my brain. She served chocolate cake and strawberry jello for the party. And all the other children kept teasing and laughing, ha, ha, ha. Jello doesn't go with cake. Where's the ice cream? Well, they couldn't afford ice cream. So we had jello. And I ate the jello, and I thanked them for the jello, and I was glad to be at the party. And she remembered that I was kind. She remembered that I didn't tease her. And so I realize, as I reflect back on that moment, that in Big Patsy, I had found an ally. I had found a defending ally. And at that fateful school encounter with Big Beach, with Beatrice the Bully, when I thought that my young life was coming to an end, as I stood and prayed, my prayer was answered. And it was answered by the presence of Big Patsy, who defiantly stood at my trembling side, towering over me like an immovable bastion of defense against my childhood enemy. Yes, those elementary school life day, I was saved. And subsequent days after that, because she became my right-hand girl, she went with me everywhere. And so now I had a new friend, I had a guardian, and I had a defender, and her name was Big Patsy. I wish I knew where Big Patsy was today. 
I'm still talking about a perfect defense. Excuse me. Okay. Definition number three. Defense. An organization or army of defenders, as in military forces, to safeguard people, nation, or a country. And Christian friends, God's word has remarkable illustrations as it relates to the word defense. And I'd like us to turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings 6. And please turn to 2 Kings 6. 2 Kings. 2 Kings, yeah, thank you. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings 6. And starting with verse 8, my Bible divides this and it talks about Elisha and the Syrian troops. Now basically this is a really long story and it goes from 2 Kings 6, 8 through the 23rd. But I'm only going to tell you the story in the essence of time. It's 10 minutes to 12. But basically in this story, and I want you to read it when you get home. But basically in this story, the king of Israel was hated. The nation of Israel would hate him. As we always heard about, you know, they were always, someone was always coming against the nation of Israel. And in this story, there is an evil king. His name is Aram. And he went to make war against Israel. But God's people had a spiritual guardian, and his name was the prophet Elisha. And so Elisha would always receive instructions from God, and then the nation of Israel would never fall prey to all these evil kings that wanted to try to destroy them. So eventually, this evil king surmised that he had a traitor in his midst because somehow all of his strategic plans fell to naught. He would plan and then the, the Israelites would escape. He would plan and they would escape. And he was wondering who was giving away his secrets. And so he thought, okay, there's a traitor in the midst. So he called all of his men together. And the men, of course, pleaded and said, oh, no, king, it's not us. It's not us. But we know of a man. There is a prophet. We know of a man. And he even knows what's going on in your private quarters. And you know what, king? We know where he's at. And so the king commanded, let's read in, together, actually, I'll read and read 2 Kings 6, 14 through 18, and let's get a little glimpse more about this story. So just 14 through 18. So God's word says, and this is after I told you that he found out that there was, that prophet knew all of his strategies. And so this is the king. Therefore he, the evil king, sent thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant, or Elisha's servant, the man of God, was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And the servant said unto Elijah, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And Elisha answered, Fear not. Get this. Hallelujah. Fear not, for they that be with us are more that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open the servant's eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And you know what the young man saw? He saw on the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That was the army of God. Angels on the mountain compassed around the evil army. They just surrounded them. And Elisha and when, verse 18, and when the king's army, or when they came down to him, Elisha prayed again. And, God, and Elisha said, I pray thee, Lord, smite this people with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of the Lord. Now cold, cl close your book, because I don't want you to go ahead. I want you to read the rest of this amazing story when you get home. And so Elisha prayed twice. And there stood on the mountain, all surrounding angels of horses and fiery chariots, etc., to come to Elisha's aid. And Christian friends, the application of this Old Testament story today is really simple because we also battle good and evil, amen? We are in a spiritual battle, and Satan never fights fair. Say that with me. Satan never fights fair. In fact, while we're even sleeping, Satan comes and he tries to to devise things that will, you know, trip us up the next day. 
But we remember that when I read the Bible that Elisha prayed. And when Elisha prayed, God sent reinforcements immediately. Immediately. And I think about this as I think about the application for today that also Satan surrounds us with thoughts of defeat sometimes. Amen? When we're facing challenges. And Satan surrounds us with doubts about God's ability to do the impossible. And Satan surrounds us with fear when we're facing things that we're not used to facing. We have doubt and we have fear, we have anxiety. And God has not given us the spirit of fear, amen? amen. But of power and of love and a sound mind. So if we keep our mind stayed on God and read his word, there will be no fear. There will be no doubt, there will be no anxiety and he will send the reinforcements. And I'm just here to remind you today, Christian friends, that Satan is no match. I like the word Jehovah Jireh because he's our provider. And Satan is no match for Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, over us in protection. Satan is no match for Jehovah Shalom who is our peace, amen? Even in the midst of our storms. Am I talking to anybody today or am I just talking to myself? Satan is no match for those of us who are on the battlefield for our Lord. Because Isaiah 59, 19 says, When the enemy comes against us like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him, or he will put the enemy to flight. Just like he put my enemy to flight. She ran away. Just like he, she put the, in the King's story, I'm going to let you read in what happened. But he will put our enemies to flight. Would you turn with me for another scripture, please? Let's turn to Isaiah 54, 17, as we continue to talk about defense as in a military strategy. When you have it, say amen. amen. I heard two amens. Hmm. Isaiah 54, 17. Amen, amen. They're coming up popcorn. Amen. All right, let's read. God's word tells us that no weapon, say that, no, no do you believe it? Say it again, no weapon, no weapon formed against us shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. No weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah. Psalms 56, 11 says, In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Can you hold on to that promise? In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Let's review definitions one through three because I'm now on definition number four. Defense, definition number one, we talked about opponent in sports to defend. Number two, we talked about protecting the physical integrity of the body and mind, like Big Patsy protected my mental integrity and my physical body. Defense, an organization or army of defenders, like, like Prophet Elijah received. And now defense, the defending of a cause or a person by speech or argument as in an attorney. The defending of a cause or person by speech or argument as in an attorney. Here's another confession. I'm going to learn all kinds of stuff about me this morning. When I have spare time, and this was a while ago, I like to watch television, black and white programs. I'm stuck in the 60s. If it's colorized, I don't enjoy it. If it's black and white, I'm all ready to watch it because that's what they had when I was a girl growing up. Growing up. Some of my favorite programs have been wholesome programs like Little House on the Prairie and The Waltons. I still love those shows. Andy Griffith. Anybody ever remember any of those shows? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dan. I saw your hand. <laughs> the only one that's admitting. Because then it's dating us, right? The Waltons. Okay. Defense, number four, the definition. Defending of a cause or a person. I want you to get that by speech or argument as in an attorney. So my favorite black and white television program as it concerns uh, television drama, of course, was Perry Mason and Matlock. Anybody know Perry Mason and Matlock? I see Rebecca's hand, yay, Perry Mason and Matlock. And you know, it's really funny that 
Frank saying no. It's really funny that my favorite was Matlock, and Matlock's character was played by Andy Griffin. So I loved Andy Griffin, and then I just kind of fell into Matlock because I liked the courtroom dramas. But I re always recall that both Perry Mason and Matlock, it never failed that those incredible television attorneys, they would present their cases for their clients, and you would always hear the jury pronounce the words, we find the defendant not guilty. Perry Mason and Matlock could just work it episode after episode after episode. Their clients were always not guilty. And then the courtroom would be erupt in, cele in celebration. So indeed, Matlock may be a powerful attorney, and Perry Mason may be a counselor without equal on this earth. But saints of God, what I'm here to tell you this morning, and you probably guessed it, is that there is no greater defense for me and for you, sinners in need of salvation, than the defense that is being given right now in the most holy place in heaven. Amen. Do you understand that? John 5.22 tells us, For the Father judges no one, but he himself has entrusted all judgment to the Son. And 1 John 2.1 Let's turn to that. That's another scripture that I'd like to share with you today. 1 John 2, 1. When you have it, say amen. I heard one amen. There's two and three. All right. I think we have it. 1 John. It's in the back. 1 John 2, 1. And remember, we're talking about a perfect defense. 1 John 2, 1 reads, My little children... These things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate or a defender. We have an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Amen. And my favorite is found in the New International Version. You may not have that. If you do, that's fine. But in Job, the book of Job, chapter 16, and 19 through 21. And let me read that for you in the New International Version. I love the way that it expressed it in this version. And it says this. It says, verse 19, even now, we're talking about Christ being the advocate, amen, and the defender in heaven, the most holy past. It says, even now, my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. And my eyes pour out tears to God. And on behalf of man, he pleads with God as a man pleads, with a, pleads for a friend. Isn't that good news this morning? God listens to the Son of Jesus Christ pleading on our behalf, defending our course, interceding on our behalf. And also Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives. He always lives to intercede for them. He always lives to intercede for me and for you. He always lives to advocate or to defend. And in the heavenly courtroom right now, as we've learned when Pastor Trujillo was preaching last week, Jesus Christ stands in our defense. Isn't that good news? He's interceding for you and for me. In Jesus, we have a defending counselor, a counselor that surpasses anything any earthly counselor or advocate or trial attorney could do. Jesus Christ, our defending counselor, whose primary objective is to plead our case before the Father. And you know, in my imagination, I'd like to think that when we're all standing there, and I'm closing, when we're all standing there before the judgment seat of Christ, that Satan will also be there to condemn. He'll be hurling his condemnations. He'll be hurling his insults. He'll be hurling his lies. And in my mind, I'd like to imagine that Jesus Christ will come and he'll stand next to me and he'll take his powerful, righteous right arm and he'll put it around my shoulder and he'll look at Satan and go, and he'll look at the Father and he'll say, Jacqueline, is not guilty. But not only me, what excites me is that, in my imagine, I believe that when, when, when Robinson is standing at the, at the judgment seat of Christ, Satan will, st I mean, Jesus will stand up and put his arm around Robinson and say, Robinson's not guilty. Richard, 
when you're standing before the throne room of God, Jesus is going to come and put his arm around you and say, Richard is not guilty. Amen. James, when you're standing before the throne room of God, Jesus is going to put his powerful right arm around you and say, James is not guilty. Gene, when you're standing at the throne room of God, Jesus is going to come and put his powerful right arm around you and say, Gene is not guilty. All of us, not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Then the whole universe will see that God was right, his justice is sovereign, that his truth will continue throughout eternity. He will, the whole universe will understand that the perfect Lamb of God became the perfect defense on our behalf. And we will live with Jesus through the ceaseless ages of eternity, not guilty. Amen. Not guilty. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask Aida to come up. We're going to sing hymn number 180. And I did let you know that when I picked this song, I understood that we didn't know this song, but I didn't care because I like the words of this song. So I asked Aida to come, and she's going to sing the first verse. If we can all turn to page 180 and stand, and then we will follow with her. So let's learn a new song today, amen? amen. Page 180. Let's just go to the last verse. Sing with them. <laughs> please remain standing as we say the benediction. Father, we're grateful that you are in the most holy place, interceding for us, sinners in need of salvation. But we have the greatest defense, the greatest defender that the history of this universe has ever known. And it's in the form of Jesus Christ, the righteous, the perfect Lamb of God. And so now we ask, Father, for your blessings as we spend the rest of this Sabbath day fellowshipping. And we thank you for being with us today and for giving us your great gift of eternal life. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, please be seated.